This presentation consists of the discussion of construction risks. It is out of best practices part H, other risk, and specifically from chapter H3 in best practices. So construction risk can have different meetings, such as costs and schedule risk assessments that we perform at the Corps of Engineers. For best practices, construction risk refers to risk to the public during construction, that is failure probability, annualized life loss, individual risk or societal risk, as well as economic consequences. Decision makers need to understand construction risk to be able to make schedule and cost trade-offs. Is always strive to, to do no harm, to not damage the land, dam or levy during construction, and to not knowingly increase risk during construction. When selecting and designing a dam or levy alternatives, it's imperative to evaluate and understand the conditions that could lead to increase in the risk during construction. Several examples or conditions really that will be shown that can temporarily increase risk during construction. So for this first example, it involves degrading a dam or levee crest that can increase the susceptibility to overtopping. This photo is from a levee project in which the levee crests have been degraded for construction of a new flood wall. Another condition is uh, excavation at the toe of a dam or a levee that can increase the likelihood of slope instability. So excavations at the toe of dams and levees can increase the susceptibility to internal erosion. For this particular project, a ditch was excavated at the landside toe of a levee that provided an unfiltered horizontal exit for backward erosion piping to occur and that eventually led to the breach of the levee. There are numerous case histories where embankments were constructed at a rate that was too fast for the pore pressures to dissipate in the embankment or foundation material uh, that had led to slope failure. So these photos are from USACE projects. The one on the left is Fort Peck Dam and the one on the right is Waco Dam that had major slope failures during construction. Coffer dams can increase the risk of flooding if not properly designed. So this photograph is from a coffer dam at Folsom Dam where the spillway construction risk is mitigated by constructing the coffer dam at the full height, the same height as the main dam to provide the same level of protection of the main dam. So here's the coffer dam at, at Folsom. This coffer dam protected the work for the construction of a new spillway, which had been completed just a few years ago, and here is the main embankment dam. If bypass tunnels are used to divert water during construction of a dam, there is a potential that tunnels could collapse or clog during construction, leaving the project with limited methods to pass inflows, which could then lead to overtopping. So this is a photo of it Ituango Dam, which is a new embankment dam that was under construction in Colombia, South America, where a landslide blocked the entrances to bypass tunnels, leaving no mechanism to control the pool. So here is the, the main dam is off of the photo here. The tunnels were located here, and this entire hillside uh, had instability issues. So spillway remediation that takes the spillway out of service for a period of time can increase the chance for uncontrolled releases or overtopping. So this photo shows an example where a spillway gate is taken out of service and repairs are made, are being made downstream of a temporary bulkhead. Gate repairs can, can potentially cause gates to inadvertently be opened and result in an unplanned release. So in this case, it was a uh, dam in Vancouver, British Columbia, that involved a, uh, a gate repairs when the gate suddenly opened, resulting in a major release that ended up with a fatality in the downstream channel. So temporary removal of flood protection can expose the protected area to increase flood risk. So this is a, a photo that shows the construction of a replacement levee 
drainage culvert with no coffer dam in place or other temporary flood protection in place. So here's the new conduit being replaced and here's the excavation through the levee and again, no coffer dam or other protective measures. Constructing remedial elements like grout curtains and cutoff walls adjacent to existing structures have led to damage and potential initiation of internal erosion. This is a this photo is of a project where high grout pressures from adjacent grout curtain construction that were adjacent to a bottom outlet tunnel penetrated the five foot thick concrete liner and buckled the one inch steel liner. So the liner buckled about three feet into the conduit and about 40 feet along uh, the tunnel. Fortunately, the liner did not fail and the liner was able to be repaired. Had the liner burst, there was a potential to initially a internal erosion into the conduit. Pressures induced from drilling fluids and grouting can be large enough to cause damage either by causing the ground to fracture or displace or both and increase the risk of internal erosion failure modes. This photo shows an embankment excavation that was fractured by grouting and you can see the fracture in this area here in a crack in the dam crest that was associated with those grout induced pressures. The last few examples include uncontrolled drilling fluids or grouting activities that can clog drainage systems and increase the risk of internal erosion failure modes or structural instability. Improperly constructed filters or drains can create unfiltered seepage exits if those filter layers were either placed too thin or missing or inadvertently removed and that drain pipes also that were not properly connected or were broken during installation. So going on to constructability evaluations, uh, constructability review should be performed during the study phase, which is alternative development, and also during design, which is for the core, we typically perform that as 65% final design. During the study phase, alternative risk management plans are formulated. Construction risks need to be considered in selecting a risk management plan. If construction risk is not considered during the study phase, a plan may be selected, which is not feasible to construct due to intolerable construction risk, could lead to unexpected delays and significant cost increases. All construction risks must be identified and properly mitigated with the objective to reduce them to tolerable levels. During design, special elements and specification requirements can be incorporated to mitigate and reduce construction risk. Construction risk can be evaluated using two methods depending on the complexity and level of risk involved. Uh, qualitative uh, risk assessments can be done using engineering judgment and quantitatively they can be performed using event trees. So given the previous examples of potential construction risk, a few examples of specification requirements that can be used to mitigate those risks can include sequence requirements. For example, requiring a slope excavation to proceed from the top down instead of starting at the toe, which could lead to destabilizing the slope. Another example is limiting the trench, the length and duration of open trenches, and also I'll add a third one to this slide, uh, video inspections of drain pipes, which is during installation and right after backfilling around the drain pipes. Uh, and this has become a pretty standard practice in the industry. So this slide shows risk reduction and mitigation measures that were used in during construction of the USACE project at East Branch Dam in Pennsylvania that consisted of a cutoff wall project. The project included using cased secant pile method to mitigate the potential for a major slurry loss and, es and excavation instability in a critical area where the embankment had been damaged by a previous internal erosion incident. Other methods had been used to mitigate construction risks, like requiring that the work be scheduled when the reservoir is historically low. So specifications uh, can require that those high risk activities occur at the low reservoir stages when it's typically low. Uh, another consideration would be that have reservoir restrictions 
to lower the pool to reduce the potential frequency of the reservoir exceeding a certain critical elevation and also requiring shorter construction durations. One of the most important aspects regarding construction risk is decision maker involvement. Designers need to clearly describe the risk, identify design and construction situations and timing that could increase the risk to the structure and to the downstream population or within the levee protected area. It may be necessary to accept a higher level of risk temporarily to achieve the long-term benefits of permanent risk reduction measures. However, the designer should not make the final decision of what level of temporary increased risk is acceptable, the duration of that risk, or the amount to be spent to mitigate those risks. A risk-informed decision on construction risk can be made only if all the information is made available to the decision makers during the alternative development and during the early stages of a final design. A key component of many dam and levee projects is a cofferdam to protect the work area from flooding. Design of cofferdams require the same risk consideration as any other water retention structure and consequences need to be carefully considered. Several considerations that need to be evaluated to evaluate uh, cofferdam risk are will the failure of the cofferdam result in uncontrolled release of impounded water that floods a population downstream or within a levee protected area or just flooding of the work area itself? There are trade offs in cost versus risk reduction that need to be carefully weighed. As previously mentioned, decision makers should be involved and potentially along with legal counsel because of potential of liability issues associated with both the contractor uh, and, the, and the dam owner in selecting the level of flood protection. One of the case histories that I'm gonna cover later involves the selection of the level of cofferdam protection, um, specifically the height of the cofferdam. I've been involved with a, a, a recent spillway design project at Louisville Dam in Texas that includes the design of an upstream cofferdam that, that needed to consider flooding of the work area along with flooding impacts of properties around the reservoir rim. Also, this had to consider who would be responsible for the cost, costs associated with damage um, or breach of the cofferdam. Would it be, in this case, the government or the contractor? So some of the considerations for cofferdams. Risk of cofferdam failure needs to consider overtopping as well as other potential failure modes like internal erosion failure modes. Uh, the next example is the cellular cofferdam in which the risk of breaching the cofferdam due to overtopping was mitigated. So as you can see in this slide, the, uh, the cofferdam itself was flooded. Um, it was flooded intentionally before being overtopped by two feet for two weeks. If the excavation was not flooded prior to overtopping, the cellular cofferdam surely would have failed since there was a, about a hundred foot difference in elevation from the bottom of the sand foundation, the bottom of the excavation floor, that is, to the cofferdam crest. After the flood, other than extensive cleanup of mud, only minor repair of erosion in the top of a few sheet pile cells was required. So now I'm going to switch to case history. So the first case history involves the replacement of an existing outlet works conduits at two adjacent USACE dams, Attics and Barker dams in the Houston, Texas area. So this project, the, the reason for the project was to mitigate internal erosion risk along and into those existing conduits. Numerous voids have been detected under the conduits and in the stilling basins. These reservoirs were determined at that time to have the highest risk in the USA's portfolio of dams due to their high probability of failure and very high estimated loss of life if the dams were to fail. This photo shows the outlet works on one of the dams prior to construction of the replacement outworks outlet. This case history demonstrates the importance of considering construction risk when determining the height of these coffer dams. So here is a plan view of one of the upstream coffer dams located here. Uh, and this is the main dam. The existing conduit outlet works is here. And then the new 
conduit will be in this location, which will require excavation of the main embankment dam through here. So cofferdams not only provide a protected area for construction, but also serve as a primary dam that holds back the reservoir during construction. So during an alternative study, a constructability review team recommended the cofferdams be built to match the full height of the main dam based on the large downstream population at risk and very high economic consequences. Subsequent to that uh, alternative study, a VE team proposed to reduce the height of both cofferdams and stated that the cofferdam does not need to equal the height of the existing dam. A reduction in the height provides a cost savings, a little increase in risk, according to the VE team. Estimated savings was 1.3 million for each dam, so a total of 2.6 million dollars. Project has already been constructed. That was based on a 75 million dollar project to save 2.6 million dollars. The VE proposal was rejected based on the increased life risk to 1.2 million people and potential 60 billion dollars in economic losses in the event of a major flood event. The estimated savings pale in comparison to the potential loss of life and the economic consequences should a major flood event occur during construction and the cofferdam be overtopped and or breached. So as it turns out, Hurricane Harvey occurred during construction, which resulted in the largest flood in the project history with between 35 and 40 inches of rain measured in the project area. A new record pool was reached that was just 10 feet below the cofferdam crest. The proposed VE study cofferdam crest would have been below the new record pool if the cofferdam was constructed at that proposed lower crest elevation significant downstream damages would have occurred and it also there would have been potential for loss of life so the second case history involves a rough river dam uh, in kentucky which was is an existing embankment dam and the project uh, required the construction of a cutoff wall to mitigate internal erosion of embankment and foundation soils into a karstic limestone foundation. Most of the cutoff wall can be built with standard hydromill construction techniques excavated in a slurry trench method. Unfortunately, the most critical location with the most open karstic network was directly under and adjacent to the existing concrete outlet works conduit. A continuous cutoff wall that fully penetrates the karstic foundation rock, including underneath the existing conduit, was required. Various alternatives were evaluated to provide an effective cutoff without replacing the conduit. So an initial alternative involved placing concrete inside the existing conduit, letting that concrete cure, then excavating that section of the conduit with, a, with the cutoff wall equipment, placing a continuous wall around and through the conduit and then reestablishing the existing conduit. It was determined that the construction risk of cutting through the conduit was too great because a safe plan for reestablishing the conduit could not be devised. Another method that was considered was ground freezing, but that was determined to be incompatible with the dam foundation and with the conduit and would result in induced stresses and related conduit deformations that could not be reliable reliably predicted. This plan would put construction workers at significant risk, increase the likelihood of conduit damage, and potentially initially initiate internal erosion into the conduit, and would increase the potential for uncontrolled spillway flows and overtopping when the conduit was be out of service. So another alternative was to build a cutoff wall without having to sever that existing conduit. This alternative consisted of a panel excavation above and on each side of the existing conduit, existing conduit located here, temporarily leaving an untreated zone below the existing conduit. After these panels are excavated, the remaining soil will be cleaned off from the conduit and the slurry filled excavation would be replaced with concrete. So here is a sectional view. Here's the concrete around from that panel construction. Here's the existing conduit. And after all the panels were cured, that is the concrete uh, in the panels, approximately 50 holes will be drilled through the conduit floor uh, to intercept karstic network below the conduit 
and then they would be grouted at closure. There was a concern that the loads from the slurry and concrete would overstress the conduit, and it was also uncertainty of potentially not grouting the voids, all the voids underneath the conduit. So then another alternative um, consisted of and was considered that consisted of a structural steel liner to strengthen the conduit. This alternative was ruled out since the installation would require the conduit to be out of service too long and would result in significant reduction in discharge capacity, which would result in significant impacts on pool elevations above the spillway crest, crest during construction. So then the selective alternative then involved mitigating excessive loads on the conduit from the cutoff wall, which included installing a temporary steel bracing system in the existing conduit and limiting concrete lift heights for the concrete wall panels. Detailed design drawings and specifications were prepared and the project was in the process of getting ready to advertise. During that final review process, questions were raised about the structural integrity of the conduit. So a 3D finite element analysis was performed of the conduit under current and assumed construction loads. The analysis showed that the conduit was overstressed in its existing condition and did not meet current design guidelines. The design team also looked at case histories of other outlet works replacement projects and cutoff wall projects. And they found that uh, an incident had occurred on an outlet works project where grouting pressure caused significant damage to a conduit. And on two other projects uh, for cutoff wall projects, inclinometers showed measurable ground displacements due to the cutoff wall installation and was felt that those displacements could have significant impacts on the existing conduit. So based on the 3D analysis in, the, in those case histories, decision makers determined that the construction risks were not acceptable due to the high likelihood of damaging the conduit, increased potential for internal erosion into the conduit, and the long period of not being able to make outlet works releases to control the pool elevation. So the project was redesigned that, it that included the construction of a new outlet tunnel through a, a new outlet works through a rock tunnel in the left abutment of the dam. So um, here's the here's the uh, location of the new tower and the new tunnel outlet works that would go below the cutoff wall that would extend from abutment to abutment. Uh, while this is being constructed, the existing outlet would be used. And once the new outlet works is in place, the uh, existing outlet would be abandoned and grouted in place. The design had a full constructability review and was found to have acceptable construction risk and adheres to the do no harm philosophy. So case history number three, the last case history, provides an example of how a quantitative event tree analysis was used to help decision makers plan the schedule for construction activities in order to reduce risk. For this project, potential liquefiable materials existed underneath the downstream shell of an existing embankment dam in a highly seismic area. A major town was located about a mile downstream of the dam that would be severely inundated if the dam were to fail. The reservoir typically goes through three annual stages. It fills during the spring runoff, that is March to June, it is lowered during irrigation and summer water use season, that's July through October, and is drawn down during the winter uh, during the flood season, which is November through February. The risk associated with liquefaction of the downstream foundation alluvium justified implementing long-term risk reduction measures. The selective alternative included excavating a portion of the downstream shell and a trench to bedrock at the toe of the dam to remove the potential liquefiable material. The trench would be backfilled with compacted fill to improve the foundation strength and a dewatering system would be installed to lower the groundwater to below the bottom of the excavation during construction. So a reliability analysis, which was based on a probabil probabilistic stability analysis that was covered in another best practices presentation, um, that was performed, these analyses were performed for slope instability under various reservoir elevations and groundwater levels 
perform uh, corresponding to both a fully functioning dewatering system and the failure of the dewatering system. So the normal maximum reservoir operating level is at 2465 with a historical maximum elevation at 2470. And just to note that the dam crest is five feet higher at elevation 2475. So the probability of a slope stability being less than a factor of safety of one for a working dewatering system was constant and very low at 10 to the minus six. And since the dewatering system was designed up to pools of 2470, it's not surprising that that the factor of safety was the same and didn't vary according to pool level. Um, and as expected, the probability increased with higher pool levels for a dewatering system that failed. And you can see by as much as three orders of magnitude, that probability of factor of safety of one uh, had increased that much. So this figure shows one of the critical failure surfaces that were evaluated. And an expert elicitation was used to estimate the probability that a remnant embankment would be left in place and or if it would be breached during different pool elevations. So the reservoir exceeded probability was estimated for the three four month reservoir annual stages. The annual exceedance uh, probability varied by as much as three orders of magnitude for the flood season, which was in November to February timeframe. The elicitation team estimated that the dewatering system had a 10% chance of failing during construction, and that was used in the risk assessment. So uh, event trees were then used to evaluate each of the reservoir annual four month stages. The one shown here is for the March to June stage. And the, the nodes that were considered included that the trench would be open, uh, a reservoir loading, which are these here, and the load was partitioned off. Um, dewatering system uh, fails, in, slope instability occurs, and the remnant embankment breaches. And I know that's a little bit hard to see, so there was a blow up of one section of the event tree that is shown here. Uh, again, the first node is the probability that the reservoir is in the selected pool interval. The reservoir loading was partitioned into the same pool elevations that the annual exceeding probability and stability analysis was performed. So that is, it was elevations of less than 2425, and then 25, 2425 to 2445, 2445 to 2465, and elevations greater than 2465. So the exceedance probability for the higher pool level is subtracted from the lower, lower pool level as part of the uh, in, in, in the event tree. The second note is the probability that the dewatering system fails, which was set at a uh, was assumed at 10 percent. The third note is slope instability. So since this is for a pool interval, the probability of failure was assigned as a uniform distribu distribution ranging between the calculated failure probability for the pool boundaries. The fourth node is the probability that the remnant embankment fails. The risk analyst estimated a uniform distribution rating ranging from 25 to 75 percent with a mean of 50 percent. So this table summarizes the results for each reservoir annual four month stage. So from the risk assessment uh, and analysis results, the winter season, as you can see, only had slightly less risk than the summer season and very identical uh, potential loss of life. Since the winter season has the risk of having more lost work days, decision makers had, had required that the work start in July. So the takeaways from this presentation are that many conditions can lead to increased risk during construction, and we showed several examples of those conditions. Constructability reviews to evaluate risk should be performed both during alternative development and also during final design. There's two different methods to evaluate construction risks. They're qualitative and quantitative. Uh, there was uh, methods to mitigate risks should be thoroughly evaluated 
and some examples were given of construction timing and schedule adjustments that can be evaluated for given alternatives to reduce construction risk. A risk-informed decision on construction risk can be made only if all key information is considered and made available to decision makers in a timely manner. And of course, the philosophy of do no harm applies to construction risk as well.